All right. So um, last time we talked about epidemic dyam uh, dynamics, sort of our first kind of example. And now I want to go further into that and connect that with a couple other relatively simple but classic examples in dynamical systems modeling that Moorcroft uh, went through in chapter six. Um, by the way, I haven't had a chance to look through all the perusal comments yet. I'm working through the uh, the, the um, proposals. So I'm going to try to get you feedback on those um, as soon as possible, and then interleave that with going through the perusal comments as well and giving people extra points for you know, good things and all that sort of stuff that I normally do. I just haven't got a chance to get around to finishing the perusal today. So that'll be up for that. So I saw there are a couple of good comments on there. I'd like to respond to them, but I haven't got around to it just yet. Okay, so um, this is actually not a figure from the chapter. This is a figure from the chapter we skipped, chapter five, um, but I like to throw it up here because um, it does uh, um, emphasize this iterative process of model building where after we found a problem, like you're kind of doing uh, now in your uh, proposals, picking a problem and then by boundary selection, that's just a fancy name for picking the variables of your problem. And then uh, coming up with a dynamic hypothesis. So that's what you'll be moving into um, as you move towards drawing that causal loop diagram and then eventually a dynamical systems model. And that dynamic hypothesis will hopefully capture some salient features of that system. And so um, we've um, in chapter five, they talk about some key um, uh, uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic hypotheses, which we can relate to those archetypes that we talked about before the midterm. And so this is sort of a simple subset of systems archetypes. And one in particular that they focus on in this chapter is S-shaped growth which we've all you know, learned now is a reinforcing loop um, at kind of early stages in a system followed by a balancing loop. And by early stages, I mean like we talked about wound healing as an example of S-shaped growth where the instant you get a wound, that's like kicking the system off and it grows a scab and that's that reinforcing loop. But as the wound closes, then the process that causes the scab formation to, to happen uh, starts getting um, reduced. And so that's that limited that limitation from the balancing loop there. So that's kind of what we mean by when these things couple together, you get this kind of S-shaped characteristic. And these show up all over real data. So, um, so this is the growth of sunflowers. So here's days from zero to 84. Here's the height of sunflowers. And so if we look at the kind of average height of the sunflowers in a sunflower patch, then there's this nice, almost linear rise. And then suddenly it just turns around and, um, and it flattens off. And so all the sunflowers are roughly the same height. Similarly, um, if we look down at U.S. cable uh, television subscribers, so this is um, a little bit dated now, but going from 1950 to the year 2000, um, cable was available as early as say the 60s or so but there weren't a whole lot of adopters and so it grew re grew really slowly and then suddenly it kind of hits an inflection point and then takes off in the 80s and um and grows and grows but then there's kind of a hint that maybe it's tapering off uh here uh, you know kind of in the 90s or so uh, not necessarily because people have found something alternative to cable um like we might think about now, but possibly because um, we've just started to hit saturation. So they say if this is the percent of households with, with TV subscribing to cable, although sunflowers technically is unbounded, like we have no reason to believe a sunflower has got an upper limit on its height. I mean, we could come up with physical reasons, but there's no like fundamental mathematical reason why there should be upper bounded. If we're talking about fractions here, then anything that's a fraction can't get any higher than 100%. So we know that it's going to start rounding off. And in reality, there might be, say, 25% of people that or of households that simply don't want cable TV. And so the, the, at some point, it's like getting blood out of a stone. And so even though there are these other subscribers out here, it um, is going to round off maybe earlier than the 100%. Um, similarly, um, we can look, or maybe in contrast to that, to adoption of cardiac pacemakers by physicians. So in this case, here's a technology. Uh, it started roughly the same time as cable became available, uh, had sort of a slow adoption. Um, and then uh, maybe this growth kind of uh, slowed down at a little bit of a stutter here. But then once 
um, it became pretty clear from physician to physician that these things were working, these, these crazy pacemaker things. There was a massive adoption. And in this case, there's nobody that was like saying that, oh, well, you know, if you need a pacemaker, uh, let's just, um, you know, it, it's it's not like there was sort of a, a preference thing. At, at some point, it just became that, that you know, that every physician was recommending pacemakers. Now, it can't get any higher than 100%. So even here, where the technology is super successful, it's not rounding out because people have gotten tired of it. It's because they've saturated the market. So there are no physicians left. Every physician is already prescribing pacemakers. Um, so it's kind of you know, so we see tons of S-shaped growth where the limitations are either um, fundamental and physical, like uh, the scab thing, that there's a process which causes it to start limiting, or it's just numerical. Depending on what you're uh, plotting, there's just no way to get above this upper bound. And so it naturally is going to eventually bend. So S-shaped growth is a really important archetype for us to understand, and it's one that we're going to see um, over and over again. Oh, um, looks like at least maybe the video feed might have died for some reason. So let me reconnect real quick to the uh, video feed here. If I can remember the, um, here it is. So those online, sorry about, about that. Hopefully the, sh the screen share is still working okay. And there we go. Turn on the video. Okay, so hopefully that's a little better for the recording. Sorry about that. All right, so um, S-shaped growth. So anything that has this sort of pattern um, is probably going to be able to be described by some causal loop diagram that's going to have a reinforcing loop and a balancing loop somewhere. So we've got the generic version on the left here where we've got some growth engine, which is going to have a growth rate that's feeding into some system state that grows, that feeds into more growth rate. And then we've got some limiting process where as the system gets bigger and bigger, the adequacy of a resource gets smaller, usually because the system reaches a carrying capacity. And that carrying capacity um, could be, again, physical and fundamental or like a process that has to do with like the scab formation, or it could be some more abstract carrying capacity, like it's numerical, like the number can't grow any higher than 100%. And so that is going to reduce the net increase, which is going to eventually reduce the growth rate. So in a specific example, if you think about sales, then as you get more sales, then uh, there's going to be um, a greater uh, increase in the sales rate. So the you know more sales is going to get you more attention, which is going to cause you to grow and have even more sales. But um, eventually, there's you just run out of people to sell your product to because they all own your product. And so then you hit saturation and then it slows things down. We're seeing this with companies like Netflix, for example. They had massive growth and then uh, partly due to people, maybe the demand reducing because, you know, uh, pandemic pressures are different and all that. But also just partly due to um, just even without changes in demand, just once you get a, a 80% of the market having Netflix, the other 20%, it's really hard for them to get on there. And, and that's why Netflix is realizing some of that other 20% are you know, sharing Netflix with somebody else, which is why they're now pushing to do this profile transfer thing and gradually going to start cracking down on people sharing Netflix accounts because they're trying to fight this um, fractional reduction in their growth rate. Because uh, they um, realize that they're pushing up against saturation. And so, again, it's like getting blood from a stone. They got to um, squeeze that thing even harder to try to get extra growth out. And so that's what's going on there. So um, this is ideally what we'd like to see, reinforcing next to balancing. And if we think about the first S-shaped growth curve that we've seen in this class, it was from this fisheries example. And I've, I think I've talked about this already, that... This fisheries example is, um, is nice um, from a, a general perspective, from a biological perspective. It's sort of a simple model 
that we can identify with and all that, but it's hard to see some of these fundamental structures here. So like it has a single loop here that is both reinforcing and balancing depending on how big the fish stock is. And that's because it goes through this lookup table, net regeneration, which I've got over here, which has fish density on the x-axis, net regeneration on the y-axis, and some curve um, over here. And when you're in low densities, this curve is uh, rising. When you're at high densities, it's falling. So based on the slope of this curve, you're either in a reinforcing loop or a balancing loop. And so it's kind of ugly to look at this because when you look at this, it's not clear from just looking at the how the dynamics are set up here, what the fundamental system archetype is, but it should be S-shaped growth. So the question is, is there a way for us to redraw this diagram so that we can see balancing and reinforcing together? And so what I've done here is I've gone from the old diagram where we just had an unlimited supply of fish. And here the valve um, gets restricted according to this net regeneration curve. So as you get higher and higher fish, the valve opens, but then at some fish density, the valve starts to close. And that um, closing happens all inside here, but otherwise the source of the fish were viewed as unlimited. That's what this kind of little cloud symbol is here. Well, my thought was, well, what if we just flip that and create a second stock, kind of a virtual stock of potential fish? So if we think back, if we go back to this previous version, so I'm just gonna keep going back and forth here, to calculate fish density, we had to know the maximum fishery size. And so this might have been a thousand fish. And so if we do the fish stock divided by a thousand, we get the density in the fishery. We know the density can't go above one. And so here, the maximum fishery size is what sets that upper bound that's definitely going to limit things, that's going to lead us to this uh, decline in the regeneration rate. So my thought is, what if instead of having this, this exogenous variable, maximum fishery size, what if instead I create another stock called potential fish, where this is like fish that haven't been born yet, and this is like fish that are born yet. So if you add the fish that are born to the fish that haven't been born yet, you get your carrying capacity back. So if you start with two fish here, you might have 9,998 fish over here, um, corresponding to a carrying capacity of 10,000 fish. So these fish don't exist in reality, but we're modeling them as if they're these sort of potentials, these kind of ghost fish that might come into existence. Now, why would I wanna do that and not have that carrying capacity that's out here? So, and this is what I'm by the way, I'm summarizing down here. So fish density now is fish stock divided by the sum of these two. And the maximum fishery size, instead of being a parameter, it is now the sum of these two things. And so if I wanna change the maximum fish free size, and I think I'm gonna give away a, um, a question later here, but um, is that um, I just changed the initial conditions for these things. So whatever the initial fish plus the initial potential fish is, that is going to be the maximum fishery size. And that will always be the sum of these things, regardless, you know, whenever you gain a fish here, you'll lose a fish there. So the sum will always stay constant. So when I do that, then the question is, can I rewrite this, um, this, this system here so that I can consistently make the loop over here, let's say reinforcing, and the loop over here balancing. So the idea is kind of like, um, as I get more fish, I'm going to get a pressure to get more and more fish. But eventually, if I'm getting really low on potential fish, no matter how much these fish would like to reproduce, they're not going to be able to because there won't be enough potential fish left over. That's what I want to kind of capture with this model. And so how do I do that? Well, I'm going to get rid of this lookup table. Um, and I could do something where I could have created another lookup table that would be similar to this. But in order for me to really kind of get, um, you know, make it clear that this is going to be a reinforcing loop and this is going to be a balancing loop, um, I am going to approximate the curve that's in this lookup table with a formula that will make that clear. And so what do I mean by that? Um, and so hopefully this formula looks maybe familiar to you from SOS 101, or if you've taken 
um, any other kind of population uh, ecology courses, this is the logistic growth formula. So if X is my number of fish, um, then this is the kind of uh, exponential growth of the fish here. And then this is the kind of logistic correction factor here, where K is the carrying capacity, where the K is sort of uh, uh, the, the, this model was, um, was developed by, by Germans who um, the term for carrying capacity actually started with a K. That's the reason why we use K for carrying capacity. And so um, this, this K minus X is number of kind of fish, basically potential fish, whereas K is the total number of fish in the fishery. So a lot of times you see it written like this down here, where um, this K minus X over K is one minus X over K, but I think it's actually nicer to write it in this form, because then you've got X as the number of fish and K minus X is kind of the number of additional fish that could be added to the fishery. And we can see that they're kind of being multiplied together. And what I like about that by writing it this way is it gives me a hint that this is a reinforcing loop because I can see that um, X seems to be having a positive influence on this. And this looks like it might be a balancing loop because um, I'll end up seeing that um, K minus X will end up having a, um, a, uh, a negative influence here because of this outflow. So we'll see how that works here in just a second. So this is our logistic growth formula. Any questions about this before I kind of move on and restructure this? You might also notice that I did um, a little bit of, a, I factored out this X divided by K here. Um, going from this to that, and this is all equivalent. Like these, this this k times this k, those would would cancel out. So it's just r x again. Um, but um, so, but this was just a. I'm doing this trick here because I'm trying to actually extract density, which is x divided by k, and this shows this way density will show up in this expression. Okay, so with that in mind, um, this little trick that I did here took the logistic growth equation and it turned it into an equation of only one variable, that variable being density. There's these exogenous uh, parameters, R and K, but if I just accept those as being set by some population biologist elsewhere, the dynamic variables, the only thing that's changing over time is the density, X divided by K. And this is great because this is this function is basically the original hump-shaped um, logistic growth curve or the hump shape net regeneration curve that was originally in the lookup table um, where the x-axis or the horizontal axis was x divided by k. So for low values of x divided by k, this rises. And for high values of x divided by k, it falls. And so we get a hump shaped curve out of this. So by putting that in there, then um, I'm starting to see here that um, I'm, I can start sort of studying um, how fish density um, how it fish density here is going to end up um, relating to these loops here. So I feel like I'm getting closer and closer to being able to analyze the sign of these loops. So I'm going to plot this here to confirm. If I plot this thing, I've got fish density on my horizontal axis, net regeneration on this axis. And I find that this formula, sure enough, regenerates basically the curve that I had in that lookup table. So now I don't need a lookup table. I can use the math instead. It's not quite the same because that lookup table had a, like a little bit of asymmetry to it, but um, for and we can add all of that stuff. But just for simplicity, I'm going with a nice, simple logistic growth uh, regeneration curve. So now I just do a little bit of um, of algebra. Um, so um, you know, I can I can play I can take this expression here, k, and I can say, well, k is always going to be x plus y. So if I call my potential fish y. I just name it that, um, then I don't need K anymore. Whenever I see a K, I can just put in X plus Y. Um, and that's kind of nice because it means that I can potentially get rid of this density block here, which requires K as an input coming in. So I'm bringing in X and Y directly into this net regeneration formula. And, um, and so when I look at that, this formula that goes in here, which is just Rx times y over x plus y, where this is k, if I think about this here, I can see now that x has a positive impact on this equation. So x is proportional to dx dt, and y has a positive impact on this equation. But 
um, the outflow here is going to decrease y because outflows always have um, negative. So I don't know why the um, the zoom keeps. Uh, well, I might just have to get. Um, I'll not use the in-house zoom, and I'll try to draw on this using my mouse. So here, this outflow, because it's an outflow, um, that's not the direction I wanted to draw that in. So let me clear that. All right, so if we remember here, outflows have an implicit negative arrow going backwards because as you increase the outflow, you're gonna decrease the potential fish. So now I can see that um, Y has a positive impact on net regeneration. The more potential fish there are, the higher the net regeneration rate. I can see the net regeneration rate has a positive impact on the outflow. Um, just because that's the reason we've written, we just copied basically net the outflow is equal to net regeneration. So they're, they're linked together. And then the negative going back. And so that one single negative means that this loop here is balancing. Whereas in the other direction, I know that X has a positive impact on this net regeneration formula. I know that this is a plus, and I know that this implicitly has another plus. So I can see here that by breaking things up into this form, I've got the exact same system, but now I've structured it so that it's very clear that there's a reinforcing loop so that all things being equal, if you could somehow hold the potential fish constant, the more fish you'd get, the higher the net regeneration rate. All things being equal, if you could somehow hold the, the number of fish constant, but then increase the number of potential fish, the net regeneration rate would go up. But as the net regeneration goes up, then opposite things happen to Y and X. As the net regeneration rate goes up, it decreases Y, the potential fish, as it increases X. And that decrease in Y um, eventually will eventually pinch this net regeneration rate off. And that's what gives us our S-shaped growth. So in this form, um, I, um, I can see the S-shaped growth without having to analyze the shape of this lookup table anymore. And that's why this structure is a little bit beneficial. And so it's a little weird to create this virtual stock called potential fish, because there aren't potential fish in reality. Like these are, you know, but it's, a, it's just an alternative way to model carrying capacity, to model the market saturation level, and in this alternative way, we get the exact same dynamics, but it's presented in a way where the, our, the system archetype is much clearer. And so that's why we're gonna see this pattern um, pretty, uh, pretty often. And we see this pattern in this chapter where they've got adopters of technology and potential adopters of technology. And so those potential adopters, we actually are a real people, like we got people with iPhones and without iPhones. Well, here it's like we've got things that are fish or are things that make up fish. And, um, and so eventually you run out of ways to make fish. And that's the same thing of running out of people who have empty pockets that you can't put an iPhone into. So this is a common way to represent S-shaped growth curves is by breaking things up into actual and uh, potential as opposed to creating this lookup table that kind of bundles both curves together inside one table. So does that modification make sense that I'm doing this weird thing where we're breaking things up in two um, as opposed to leaving them in that um, original form where everything was tied up in the lookup table? Does this idea of potential fish make sense? Okay, so let's see how that connects to the chapter. So. Um, so as I was mentioning, the carrying capacity of this uh, fishery is now the initial condition of the potential fish plus the initial condition of the fish stock. So if you wanted to go and build this in VinSim or Insight Maker, and I told you to simulate it with a carrying capacity of a thousand fish, then, um, and I'd say, and then initially you'll have one fish in the system or two fish in the system, you would set this to two 
and this to whatever the carrying capacity is minus two. And then if you run the thing, then the sum of potential fish plus fish stock will always be exactly a thousand. So before we had to have a carrying capacity block out here that was connected into density. Now we can get rid of that extra variable and it's just gonna be the sum of these things. So the initial conditions of multiple stocks when added together, determine the, the 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 max size. So that's the weird thing about this is we've taken carrying capacity, which we usually think of as one number, and we've effectively turned it into multiple numbers added up together. So does that transformation make sense? That in we do have a carrying capacity inside here, but it's the sum of the initial conditions of the compartments. It's just like in the SIR model, there's always 10,000 people. Nobody dies, nobody's born but they move around where they are. So here there's always a thousand fish, but they're either potential fish or real fish at any instant of time. So if I were to ask you like on a final exam, like what's the carrying capacity of this system? And I were to show you that, um, you know, at a certain snapshot, um, there would be a um, hundred potential fish and 500 uh, fish, then you know that it would be 600 would be the uh, carrying capacity of this system. Okay. All right. So that's all I'm saying here. Okay, so um, this is our, you know, this is basically a Vincent version of what I was just drawing there. Remaining fish capacity, that's kind of like potential fish and fish stock. Uh, we've got our birth rate here, which is just this background birth rate times the current number of fish trying to have new fish uh, times this kind of limiting factor, which is, um, you know, the potential fish here. When you start looking at this, I hope it kind of looks a little bit like the SIR model, where it's almost like I've got infected individuals, how often they're bumping around into anyone else. And then over here, this is the total population. And this is the fraction of the population who are susceptible or who are potential fish. So really, this is exactly the same formula that we had for our SIR model, um, where you know the the need to reproduce is just the the background encounter rate, and but the actual fraction of encounters that lead to infections or reproductions is the fraction of the population that is uh, the remaining fish capacity, and so with that in mind, um, you know does this rate look familiar? Um, you know I can just put you know this is like susceptible and this is like infectious and this birth rate is like the change in infectious over time and so really this is again the exact same formula we saw in the SIR model where we've got um, this v times c well this is like um, the um, th like our infectivity uh, times contacts per day and then this is the fraction of those contacts per day that are dangerous so we've seen this archetype, or we've seen this structure before. So population growth in SAR models, like once you get used to one set of formulas, you know the others, they're identical. You just gotta like do the analogy. So I think that's what I'm kind of showing here that, um, the, that this fish capacity, fish stock is really just the SI part of the SIR model. Does everybody see that? That, you know, that once you understand population growth, you understand half of the SIR model and vice versa. So susceptible population may as well be potential fish. Okay. So, um, and then this is kind of it, kind of written out a little bit more here. So infectivity is this V, um, context uh, per day as this C times I, and then this um, this is our number part. This is our number of susceptibles over total population. So again, the flow in the SIR model matches this here. So. We get used to seeing these things, we'll see them over and over and over again. And so that gets us to the chapter. So the chapter focuses mostly on the bathation diffusion. And this is basically, and it's not, although I've got it related to a fishery model here, it's not named after Bass the fish, it's named after a, a guy whose last name is Bass, who was an operations researcher who came up with this model for the dynamics of a market. and. 
it is effectively, although it's a, in some ways a population growth model, it was sort of um, viewed as a contagion process. And so they really thought of this as kind of an adaptation of, an, of the kind of an SIR model or an FI model, where you've got potential adopters, those are ones who are susceptible to infection. Adopters, those are the ones who actually are infected with the product. And the process of adoption is um, in part the process of adopters finding potential adopters and convincing them to adopt. And so um, that's one of our growth engines. And then the other growth engine is going to end up being advertising. Um, and so advertising is the part that is different from both the fish population models and the infection models. But the underlying process before advertising is identical to population growth as well as the SI part of the SIR model. It's just the same things over and over and over again, slightly different variables, but the same formulas, the same thought process. So that's what I want you to see. So um, when we look at the um, uh, the bass model here, we know it's an S-shaped growth curve because it's in kind of the chapter about S-shaped growth. But again, now we can say, well, what determines maximum market size? Well, this goes back to thinking about the fishery. So if um, from that discussion that I just said about what's the carrying capacity of a fishery, what would we say is the maximum market size? If I were to show you this model on an exam, um, and ask you, what's the maximum market size? What's the maximum number of people who could possibly own this product? What would be a good answer to that? Yeah. That's right, adopters plus potential adopters or um, the initial number of potential adopters plus the initial number of adopters. That sum of initial conditions will give you the total market price. And then as you simulate the system, um, it will always be that the number of potential adopters plus the number of adopters will always equal that initial sum. Does everybody see that? Any questions about that? That in this form, the equivalent of carrying capacity is actually encoded into the initial conditions and not an extra variable. Even though we often will write this as kind of a generic form of S-shaped growth. Okay, questions online? Even though the Zoom camera keeps dying, I still have the chat open, so. Okay. All right, so now let's look at the formulas and these should look very similar to what we've already seen. So in this BAS model, we've again, so adopters, these are people who own iPhones, potential adopters, these are people thinking about buying an iPhone or, or you know, potentially could buy an iPhone or an Android phone or whatever. An electric vehicle um, could be somebody who could be talking about recycling. These are people who recycle. These are people who don't recycle, but could. Um, and so, so if we look at the total population, that's always the sum of these two. The adoption rate, um, this that's over here. This is modeled in Stella with a slider so that you can adjust adoption rate on the fly, just like in Synthesim. And, um, and it goes um, into this adoption from word of mouth which goes into adoption rate. So adoption from word of mouth is the product of the number of adopters times the contact rate times the adoption fraction times the potential adopters divided by the total population. So all of that is going into here is this little product here. And I hope that we can see that you know, this is exactly the SI part of the SIR model. We have our susceptible population and our infectious population. And then over here, this contact rate, um, it's like an exact translation. So this is how often do adopters uh, bump into anyone else in the population who will see them using this technology or using this thing. The adoption fraction is of all of those uh, that they bump into, how many are likely to actually take up that technology they see them using? Oh, I saw you using an iPhone. I saw you driving an electric vehicle. I saw you recycling. Given that I saw you doing that, then what is the probability that I will change my behavior and start doing that myself? And, um, and then this formula here, potential adopters divided by total population, that's the fraction of those contacts that are actually with people who 
have room to change their behavior. So if everybody's recycling, there's kind of this, uh, it's impossible to find somebody to, to convert to recycling again. And so the adoption rate drops to zero. But if um, there's some people who are recycling and some are not, then every time you bump into somebody, you have a chance of bumping into somebody who's not recycling. And so that um, uh, that fraction, that's potential adopters, that's the number of non-recyclers divided by the total population. And as long as that's non-zero, then this adoption from word of mouth has a potential to be um, uh, non-zero itself. So this is exactly the SI model, just written in a kind of marketing speak about adoption instead of infection. Does everybody see that? Any questions about that? The analogy there is pretty clear. So this is what we mean by a contagion model. And if we simulate it, and so here we've got line two is the number of potential adopters. Line one is the number of adopters. Then S-shaped decline and the number of potential adopters. S-shaped growth and the number of adopters. This is just like the S-shaped decline and growth in the S and R compartments in the SIR model. And then if I look down at the adoption rate, the flow that's inter that's interacting between these two, and that has its own little peak. And this is just like the infection peak in the SIR model. So it really is a contagion type model that um, we're just, you know, instead of, you know, by modeling adoption, the, the dynamics are identical to modeling infection and, and spread of disease, but now it's spread of innovation. And so we can see that if we just, you know, that if we look here with these parameters, the peak adoption rate happens like six years after the introduction of the new technology or of the innovation. So even though uh, by 10 years, everybody's doing it, everybody's using the pacemaker or whatever, um, it takes a really long time to get things going, kind of like those real pacemakers. So one of the questions would be, then how do we increase the speed of adoption? Now, this is not a question we would typically ask in the SIR model. We don't usually want to increase the speed of the spread of something, unless we're trying to like kill mosquitoes or something like that, and we want something to spread through that population. So this is a unique question to advertising. So this is where we're going to stray from the SIR type dynamics, and that's by introducing advertising. So we add a separate little feedback here where this is a way for us to kind of inoculate the, um, the population with this innovation or this disease artificially so that we don't have to depend on word of mouth up front. So in other words, it's how do we get initial the initial adopters there? So when all you have is potential adopters, then you can uh, have an advertising process that we can model as um, this adoption from advertising, which is gonna depend on only the number of potential adopters and advertising effectiveness. And so this is modeled as a slider that we can play with here, which basically has to do with how much money are we willing to spend? Because the more money we spend, the more effective advertising is. And by effective, I mean, how um, per day, how many new adopters are we gonna get through advertising alone? And that's what this advertising effectiveness is. And if we get enough of them, word of mouth will take over. And so that's what is kind of shown here. If we simulate that new process and we look kind of closely here, we get um, the similar S-shaped growth and declines, but this, in this peak adoption happens at like 2.6 years. And so you get the same outcome here, but it happens much faster. It starts much sooner. So most of these dynamics are driven entirely by word of mouth, but this kickoff here, kind of this slight difference in how this infection peak starts here is from that initial ad advertising. So that's why you advertise. You don't advertise to maintain um, you know, growth. You ad advertise to start growth because as we'll see in the kind of case study towards the end here, it's really costly to try to drive growth entirely with advertising. The only sustainable way to grow in terms of innovation is if eventually word of mouth takes over. So you can yell at people as much as you want about recycling, but um, ideally, hopefully some of those recycling people will put their big green bin out on, the, um, uh, out on their curb. And the fact that it's green, it's a different color, that will help advertise um, in, in a word of mouth sense 
that those people are recyclers. And so they'll end up becoming advertisers for you for free. So that's why word of mouth ends up being far more powerful than advertising. But we need advertising to start out. So any questions about this idea? The BAS model is just the SI model plus a little part where you need the initial infection being added by um, advertising. Okay. And so with the BAS model, we can experiment with things like how much money should we spend on advertising? All right. Okay, so that's one thing we kind of learned from the chapter um, and, um, you know, is how we can take a model and then bolt stuff onto it to make it our own. And we can see other examples of that. So, um, so this, we already said that this is the BAS model here, which is basically the SI model plus advertising. But if we want to think about the types, and this is the type of thing you might do in your final project. So you might say like, I want to model, you know, the diffusion of recycling through a population or something like that. Um, and say, well, you can start out with things that look a lot like that and then add a little bit to them. That's perfectly reasonable to do. So like in this case, you could think, well, let's say we don't just want to talk about a generic product. We want to talk about um, a product that will have uh, repeat purchases. So I, I use baking soda as a great example of this, where baking soda is one of these few products that you can convince people to buy and immediately throw away. So they buy baking soda and then they dump it down the drain and um, or they buy baking soda and instead of using it for baking, they put it in the refrigerator and they tell them that it goes bad after 30 days. And so you need to refresh it or something like that. So this is great because you can, um, you know, if you just depended on baking soda for baking, um, unless you do a lot of baking, one box of baking soda would take a very long time um, to use. So, um, so these sorts of things sort of help you guarantee that you get repeat purchases. So how do we model repeat purchases with the BAS model? Well, we can take our standard BAS model, but then we bolt on this thing to the top where we say, well, for every adopter, we can create a repeat purchase rate, which will just add to our sales rate. So we've got from the initial adoption, that gives us some sales, but then every adopter is gonna give us additional sales. So if we wanna model our total sales, we need to look at more than just who's adopting the product, but how often are they repeat purchasing? And so we can have a slider that says, well, how quickly are people consuming our product? And then that can help us see how our sales are being balanced between initial adopters and repeat users. And so we can help analyze how important it is to convince people to come up with repeat uses. And so, um, you know, and we may find that for your particular product, you don't actually get that much out of this repeat purchasing. And so it's not worth marketing these uh, uses. But for baking soda, I think they found that um, the adoption rate was so kind of slow that they could come up with alternate purposes or alternate reasons to use baking soda. And then that would increase this repeat purchase rate. And that is a major part of their sales. And so that's a simple idea. We're not even adding on new dynamics. You're really just adding on a new way to do calculations on top of the existing dynamics. So that's one thing we can do. Another thing that we can model that's fundamentally different from sort of a general uh, purchase is a so-called durable item, like a refrigerator. You know, hopefully um, a refrigerator will last for a long amount of time, um, but, and that's what makes it durable. So a durable good is something where um, you get its value over a long period of time. You don't buy it and immediately realize its value. Its value comes to you over time and you only buy very few of them. So you buy a refrigerator once and hopefully you keep it around. Um, you know, refrigerators 20 years ago might've lasted 20 years. Refrigerators now last three or five, but either way, it's still better than like one. Um, and so, but if we think about uh, how we want to model that, then uh, we've got an adoption rate, but we've also got a discard rate because now it's important to think about, um, you know, when they buy it, like we're only going to get the sale when they transit from potential to adopter. And then they're not ever going to buy it from us again. And so um, then we have to kind of mod the discard rate becomes kind of important here. So what's the average product life and how does that affect our sales? And so there's a possibility that when they discard their broken refrigerator, they'll buy a new one from us. 
Well, they might buy a new one from someone else too. So there's a bunch of other questions you could ask here, but this discard rate becomes a focal um, uh, uh, issue in sort of how many adopters are out there. Like, you know, um, because they're, they're, because th they, the adoption happens so infrequently. And this modification is pretty much identical to the modification. So the way we model discard rate here is, we'll just say maybe adopters divided by average product life. So average product life, we can put that in, and that's like a time constant. So we know that on average, every refrigerator lasts for five years, we drop a five year in there. And then that is tells us how often we're gonna churn from adopters back to potential adopters. And so um, this, so this is just a, a pattern that we've seen before, like in our bacteria. And if we look at this, this should look familiar to something at the very end of the epidemiology. This is like the SIS model, where now we have susceptibles that become infected, but then become susceptible again. And so this means that if we simulate this, then what we find is in the market, there's always going to be some fraction of individuals who have refrigerators and some small fraction of individuals who are going to be in need for a refrigerator. And if we adjust the mean duration of the disease, or in this case, the mean lifetime of the refrigerator, we can study how that's going to change the background level of people who are looking for a refrigerator at any unit time. And if we're, you know, Best Buy or Spencer's or whatever, then we might be able to use this information to figure out how to stock our inventory. So would we, ex should we load up on a whole lot of refrigerators or not? And, um, and how does over time, if this mean duration gets lower and lower, how is that going to affect these things? So that's kind of another example where we can just bolt on. If we're really interested in this repeat purchase of durable items, then we bolt on a little flow, and it's still base model with a minor modification. That's just what we're showing here. So, um, so I mean, I've shown you three examples, the fish population, the um, SIR model, and the bass model. And so if you think about it, the fish populations like the fundamental one, the SAR model added a recovery stock, but it's still basically population growth. And the bass model added advertising. Now I've shown you kind of slight modifications of the bass model. This is a totally useful and, and, and fine way to build models. And when you think about your final projects, you don't have to start from scratch. You can really think about like, are there growth processes? Are there limitation processes? What systems have we seen that looked kind of like this? Can we start with a fish population and then say, but then what, how different are we? Well, fish don't have advertising. Well, let's add advertising to fish and there's our system. So rather than starting from scratch, it's usually very useful to sort of start with a system that is similar in analogy and then gradually add details to move it toward you on the modeling spectrum towards kind of your more specific case. Hopefully those examples kind of make sense. And it doesn't mean that the SIR model or the fish, or the fish growth, or whatever is going to work for you. But I just want to throw those up there. It's like, we're going to see a lot of examples. So feel free to start with those before you go off and do your own thing on your final project. So questions about any of that? Okay. All right, so um, other tips that I get from this chapter um, is what, what can you do with these models? And these are examples of things you might wanna do. Like in your final project, you're gonna want to come up with ways that you can sort of justify why you even built the sim. And a great thing you can is explore hypothetical scenarios that have outcomes that you may not have been able to anticipate without the sim. And so they gave this example toward the end of the chapter of EasyJet, this um, low cost carrier introduced in, in Europe that um, wanted to get in, uh, into the, uh, the, the air, um, well, the, the, they wanted to create a new niche for low cost air and start competing with the big airlines. And so it's a, this bright new business idea, low cost air travel. Um, they establish EasyJet and then, um, puts a huge amount of capital down to buy 12 brand new Boeing 737. And so the question is, and these are durable goods, right? I mean, so you don't immediately get the benefit out of this. So then the question is, um, are you actually going to make up this $500 million 
Um, and how quickly is that going to happen? And it turns out that it takes about 1 million passengers to end up uh, making up for that 500 million. And I think that's without worrying about the time value of money, interest rates and all of that. So we want to build a model that sort of helps us plan our strategy for deploying these planes and figuring out if it's possible for us to hit this. And if we need to modify our strategy, let's say add advertising and all that to be able to, to reach this a million passenger threshold. So we need to come up with a dynamic hypothesis for um, how the our new product is going to diffuse through this existing market. So how do we model growth? So just like, and this could happen in your final projects, you're like, we have a growth loop. So how do we model that? So look as well, Growth, typically we need to start with a thing that's growing as a stock and we need to have an inflow because it's going to be growing and so it has to come from somewhere. The inflow is how things grow. So potential passengers to EasyJet, increase in potential passengers to EasyJet. And what's the one way we can get growth? Well, advertising is one way we can get growth. So not counting on word of mouth at the moment. And so there's marketing spending or as the Brits would say, marketing spend. Um, that um, goes into this. And we have a little slider, which allows us to adjust our level of spending in our SIM. And then we've got marketing effectiveness. So for every dollar we spend, how many passengers do we turn over with that? And so um, hopefully we have some data on marketing effectiveness we can put into that. And so then we can say just by advertising alone, um, how much money do we have to spend in order to achieve our 1 million passenger um, threshold? And if we look down at it, we don't probably don't even need simulation for this. We can think, well, if the marketing spending is, um, you know, 2.5 million pounds per year, and the effectiveness is 50 passengers per um, uh, thousand pounds spent, then if you kind of do the math there, then, um, you know, so this is uh, 50 times 20, 125,000 new passengers per year. So at this spending level, um, this is not a million. So we have to spend, a, you know, we have to keep spending this amount of money every year for whatever, eight, nine, 10 years in order to firmly go over this 1 million passenger. And so that's a, a lot of money to turn into passengers. And so um, already, you know, we were talking about, we put this huge investment in these planes you just want to throw advertising money after it because then we have to say, well, how do we make up all that advertising money? So this clearly is not a sustainable strategy to reach a million passengers because it just puts a huge cost on us. So we'd say, but in reality, we should hopefully be able to count on some word of mouth. And so we just use a little bit of marketing to get people interested in EasyJet. And then we're hoping that existing EasyJet passengers will then talk to others and get them to come over to EasyJet. And you say, well, what ultimately is going to drive that? Well, it's the relative fare. So how much cheaper is EasyJet than the big carriers? And so we're, we might need a lookup table, which we'll have to maybe do some markup research here, market research here that will tell us that um, if we are 50% cheaper than the big carriers, how many extra passengers are we going to get via word of mouth? If we are 75%, if we are exactly equal to it. So it's probably going to be that if our fares are identical to the big carriers and the big carriers are a little bit nicer experience, then when our potential passengers tell their friends that they spent the exact same amount of money as they would on a main character or on a main carrier, then we're probably not going to get any word of mouth growth. And so that's what's being modeled here. So we can drill down into that and we can say, well, the increase in passengers is due to our marketing plus the conversion ratio from potential passengers. The conversion ratio is a lookup table based on relative fare. And we can look at that lookup table and we've got it here. So the idea here is we've got relative fares zero to 1.2. So what the relative fare is, is how much more expensive um, the, um, let's see if I get this right. Oh, here, down here, I've got it right. So the fare set by startup divided by the arrivals fare. So um, if we talk about uh, zero, then that means we have a free flight. And so we're saying that if we offer um, flights for free, we will get three passengers for every one passenger, like three new passengers for every one passenger. But if we 
um, have are charged exactly what the carriers charge, 1.0 relative fare, then we will get zero new passengers per every one passenger. And of course, if we charge any more than that, it's also still gonna be zero. So this little lookup table here, which hopefully you could find data for this, but even if you didn't, for the purposes of your, your final project, this shape is all that really matters here. Is that, and you could do a sensitivity analysis to see uh, how much do things change if this three is actually a five or a 10. Um, but then this, this general shape here, where once you get your, the fair becomes really close together, you get no word of mouth growth, then that's gonna pretty much kill um, this, uh, this easy jet there. So they really need to grow while they can be cheap relative to the, 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 uh, the rivals. So we're not modeling how the rivals change their money yet. They were just saying, assuming that we can be cheaper than the rivals, how will that affect our growth process? So are there any questions about this simple growth system where we, you know, it's just your standard kind of growth here. It's a little bit of marketing to get the growth started so that you don't need an initial number of passengers here. So you could actually start with zero passengers, but then this marketing would end up introducing new passengers and then kick off word of mouth. And then we modulate the word of mouth by this relative fare that for now we're assuming is exogenous. We're assuming that we're gonna set a price and the rival carriers are not going to respond. And as long as we're cheap enough, the word of mouth will cause us growing. So does that make sense for our simple model of growth at EasyJet? Questions in class or online? So examples of how to use lookup tables when you don't know the formulas just to get the general patterns. Well, well the thing is in real life, what's gonna happen? So what would happen when a low cost carrier, what happens already when low cost carriers enter markets? What do the existing carriers do? They're gonna try to lower their own prices, right? So, but how do they lower prices? Like, um, I mean, ultimately, they're going to be limited, right? So you can't just lower the ticket price. That might mean you need to restructure things. You might need to lay off some people. You might uh, need to cut services that you you offer. So maybe you don't have free check bags anymore, et cetera. It's going to take time to uh, lower that price. And that is what the, the, the EasyJet's counting on, that the, the major carriers can't immediately lower their fare in response. So we need to now model those dynamics. How will a rival change their fare in response to our fare? Well, um, the rival's fare will change over time. Well, if, if the rival fare is going to change over time, what does that suggest? How should we model this in VinSim? What should we, we going to go up to the VinSim or we're going to go to Insight Maker? What type of variable should we select to represent rival's fare? Should it be a stock, a flow, or a normal variable? Yeah. A stock, that's right, absolutely. Anything that changes over time, fundamentally, I mean, of course, variables and other things change over time, but something that you know, like is the key variable you're trying to modify there, you're saying, how does this change over time? That should be a stock. So we're gonna need to draw that in as a stock and then model its flow, how it's changing over time. So is it possible for it to change instantaneously? What determines the timing um, and so on? So these are the things we're gonna have to model. So we put the fare in as a stock, and we've got a flow, change in rival's fare. Now notice it's got two arrows. That's Stella's way of indicating that the flow can be an outflow or an inflow, depending on whether it's negative or positive. And the, um, the, the, the white side or the, I don't know, I mean, they're both filled, but the, the one that's, that's filled with white here, that's the positive direction. So if this is positive, it's an inflow. If this is negative, it's an outflow. And so we now need to build a change in rivals fare. So we're gonna kind of do this similar to how we did the restructuring of the police force from before the midterm in one of those examples out of Moorcroft, where we say we have a, um, that we would like to bring, we now I'm referring to the, as a rival, a rival would like to bring its fare down to the fare set by the startup. So that becomes an input that we would like to pull our fare down to that fare. But we can't do that immediately. And so we have a time to change costs. This is the toilet model all over again. This is the water level at the top of the toilet. This is the water level right now. This is 
how quickly the valve can change the water level. So we can model, um, you know, how long it takes for the fare to reduce, for the rival to reduce their fare by a dollar. And that will end up being this. Like, so we know that in order for them to reduce their fare by a dollar, they need to, um, you know, restructure something internally that just takes time to restructure. They have to do new routes, new whatever. And that can be somehow summarized by this time to change costs. Now, we can use a slider here because we are easy jet. And so we're sort of trying to do strategic planning to say, we don't know how fast they're going to change. They could change this fast. They could change this fast. So we should use this as a slider so we can move that around and see different scenarios there. And so what's the formula that's going to be in here is basically going to be the rival's fare um, minus the fare set by startup. It's like tank gap. It's like the water level um, or the target water level minus the water level divided by the time to change costs. That's what the change in rival's fare is. It's just the toilet model all over again here. It's a simple smoothing delay where every time the fare changes, there is a smoothing delay in how the rival fare changes. And the time constant is the time to change costs. So we're seeing the same things over and over and over again. And once we build that, we can connect it to the relative fare. Um, so the relative fare is the fare set by startup and the rival's fare. And that relative fare used to be an exogenous variable. But now we see we have two sectors. We have our easy jet sector and arrival sector and the exogenous variable in the easy jet sector is now connected to the output of the rival sector so that now it's one big system together so we've endogenized the relative fare by adding fare dynamics here so any questions about what i mean by you know we've got a simple model maybe overly simplistic but it's just a model that allows us to do strategic planning so we can see um, you know, if it takes this long for them to change their fare by a dollar, how is it going to affect our response? If it takes this other amount of speed for them to change their fare by a dollar, how is it going to affect us as EasyJet? Okay, questions online. All right, so this is the way that looks in terms of equ equations here. Um, here's our initial condition for the rival's fare. It's uh, you know, 25 pounds per passenger mile. Um, the change in rivals fare, and this is again just the toilet model. So fare set by startup, that's like the target water level, minus the rivals fare, that's like the current water level, divided by time to change cost, that's the time constant. So um, so that is what sets this change in rivals fare here. Uh, we can set the fare set by startup, um, in this case, as an exogenous variable to this system, is that price. And we can set the time constant to four years. So every pound um, that you can, it would take you four years to um, to change this by a pound, you know, you know um, per passenger mile. And uh, and so that's kind of where we set things. And since this is the slider, then we can move this around as we're playing with the sim. So um, as I've kind of been hinting at here, you should hopefully recognize that this equation and this structure is exactly a smoothing delay. And so um, we could use an exponential smoothing function in VinSim or InsightMaker, like smooth or delay, instead of this whole block here. And so um, where the uh, initial condition for that smoothing delay would be um, uh, this point two five. So um, it's InsightMaker, it's smooth. VinSim, it's smooth I, because it has an initial condition, because we need to put that initial thing there. So I can basically replace this whole ugly box block here with its stock with a rival's fair block, which just has smooth or smooth I, which will um, will automatically implement this um, connection between the fair set by startup and the rival's fair. So again, it's like the toilet model in a single command. You don't have to do it that way, but and here it is right here. So I think actually in Moorcroft, in the text, on SMTH1, that's how Stella implements a smoothing delay. And you can see it's got the target. This is like the input. This is like the time constant, and that's the initial condition. So smooth I in VinSim with these arguments, uh, smooth and insight maker with these arguments, and that completely gets rid of this whole thing here. All right. Any questions about how that's a smoothing delay?
Okay. Sure, yeah, yeah. So then once we've got that, we can connect it back up to the relative fair. Um, and, um, and then you can ask like, are there other things that we're missing? So we're, this is our easy jet example again here. Um, we've got how the relative fare is changing over time. We've got how potential passengers are growing, but we could think, you know, whenever we've got growth, the other thing we should think about is are there other limits to growth? And so we can bolt on other things. So we can say, well, um, since this is specifically has to do with uh, air travel, there's route saturation. So eventually, if you only have two routes going to one particular place, and if you fill those planes up, you just can't increase passengers anymore. So you not only can saturate the number of passengers that are out there, you can saturate your resources, the number of planes you have and the number of routes you have. So we might need to build something in like that. You also can have churn, you can lose passengers. And so um, there's a balancing loop here that is pulling passengers out of this. And so, um, you know, and that's gonna be affected by your service reputation. If your reputation uh, takes a hit, then you're gonna increase the amount of churn. Um, and so you're always gonna have some amount of churn as passengers just decide to go elsewhere. So that's another thing you can add on. Uh, and, and so the reason I'm, I'm showing this is like, things are getting more and more complicated. When you look at a complete model, it's gonna look like, where did they come up with all that stuff? But when you build your models, and you should think about this as a final project, don't try to build them all at once. You know, remember this all started with potential passengers and an inflow, and it didn't even have any feedback loops. We started with potential passengers and marketing, and we added a loop. And then they had this relative fare that we decided to put in there. Then we needed that. We added a little system over here for relative fare. We keep bolting on little bits to little bits. But overall, fundamentally, it's all stuff you've seen before. So start with small Lego blocks and keep building onto it. And that's what they've done here. And eventually, after you do all of that, you've got a growth engine. You've got um, a rival, uh, sort of a, uh, an adversarial section here, the rivals and how they respond. And then you've got the route saturation process as well as the churn. So um, you've got all of those things together and you've got what now looks like a pretty complicated causal loop diagram summarizing an even more complicated uh, stock and flow diagram. But if you really think about it, if you build it up step by step, none of this was that difficult. Like none of it was that complicated. So we started from small bits and we grew on top of it. So don't try to start here, start here, add this, add that, add that, and then eventually you'll get something. And for your guys' final projects, I mean, I'd just be happy if, you know, you had these two things. Um, you know, the rest of this, it'd be icing on the cake because it just, you know, it's a, it's a narrowly scoped. This is your first time doing it and you only got half a semester to do it. So, and so I'm kind of using this here as a model for what you should maybe think about for that final project. And if we zoom out here, we can see that, we really have, after all of that, just a variation on Bass's diffusion model. There's our growth loop, there's our balancing loop um, with advertising that's been built in there. So again, it's really just the Bass model that uh, with a couple of modifications added on. So start with a basic model and make it your own. That's my, my big message from this chapter. And um, so after you do that, you'll formulate the whole thing, you're gonna run it, and you're gonna test it. Um, and so we're not gonna get all the way through, I think this today, but um, but the rest of, and if, you know, I've got this, some videos for how to use sliders in more exciting ways on Canvas, but the rest of these slides, which I'm not gonna go through in great detail here, but um, as you've seen through the chapter, what they were able to do is basically take one slider. So again, this is a great example for your final project. They generated really interesting results by taking a single model and moving a slider around. Two sliders, sorry. They've got marketing spend. So again, that's how Brits say spending is spend. So the amount of money that you're putting on uh, your spending is marketing. And then the time to change costs. So this is how much money we're investing in EasyJet. And this is how much money or how much time, how quickly our rivals are responding. And it sets up effectively four qualitatively different regions. And so up here, we spend um, a lot and our rivals do not respond uh, very quickly. 
And as a consequence, we grow super fast and in only a couple of years reach our threshold. So that's what this blue line is. But if our rivals were uh, in a more, they moved more quickly to respond, we see that we don't grow, we saturate at a different level. We still reach this, and it's a little bit later that we hit our threshold, but it's not that much later. Down here, we've got um, very little that we've chosen to spend, but our rivals fortunately have not responded very quickly. So we still, it takes longer to hit our threshold, but we grow to a high level. This is a major problem is if we are too cautious in our marketing, our rivals and our rivals have fast retaliation. It's just like water off a duck's back. Our rivals will look at us and not think, uh, then blow by us and not think about it again. And we'll be stuck always under threshold. So these, this, you know, this is a great example. A single model with two sliders sets up four qualitatively different scenarios that we can then make um, conclusions about that we need to make sure that we market fast enough, but maybe we don't need to market super fast and so on and so forth. So this would be a great sort of comparison you could have like in your final project. All right, so I don't want to keep you any longer here. Um, reminders, um, we've got other chapters coming up. Uh, Sunday night, you got your muddiest point. You got this assignment E2. Uh, we're going to um, introduce a new assignment on Thursday, E5, and that will be, I think, the last assignment you have. So the rest of the semester um, will be uh, working on your final project and maybe a little bit of this reading. So with that, let me give you an attendance exercise. And if you've got any other questions, I'm happy to chat about those after. And the question I guess I have for you here is, um, is what, um, what is the analogous compartment for susceptibles in the BAS model? In other words, the BAS model had a couple of compartments in it. In other words, stocks. So what is the analogous stock for susceptibles in the BAS model? from an analogy between the BAS model and the SIR model. That's all I've got for you. So um, again, if you have any other questions, feel free to come up. Otherwise, we'll talk to you uh, on Thursday. Are there any other questions online? Right, in that case, I will end the meeting.